Good morning, Alex. It's like 2 a.m. in the morning, right? No, it's 5. It's the middle of my day, 5 a.m. Okay. That's when I kind of, I wake up at midnight uh, okay. spiritually. That's when I get a bing, okay. and all of a sudden I'm like, let's do something. Okay, well, you're going to do something. You're going to, uh, hopefully, we will have a great Q&A with you. So good morning, Alex, and thank you for being here. We're very excited to discover all the adventures that you've been through the years and uh, living in Moscow these days uh, right. since the lockdown, you said. And um, uh, uh, on a personal note, I enjoyed your movie very much. It's very, okay. it's very energetic. It's interesting. It has all the ingredients, you know, to please everyone. And uh, our friend Igor and his lovely wife, Eva, next to him, uh, Igor will uh, moderate. So, I, uh, so you're in a good, good hands now. And Igor, it's all yours. And thank you, Georges. It's good to see you, Alex. I really admire your movie. And okay. I want to talk about it. But before we start, yeah. just do all of us a favor. Just play the song. You, I see guitar in your hands. Can yeah, you I, I always have a guitar in my hands. Let's start from your favorite song right now. What's my favorite song? Well, <laughs> That's pretty hilarious because I don't know why, but oh, you know what it is? My favorite song in the history of the planet, actually I do have one. It's the one Beatles song that, that far and away is the most Russian sounding Beatles song. And that's not why it's my favorite. I didn't choose it. I just looking back in 2020 hindsight, I can explain it that way somehow. Maybe it's a deep psychological reason, but I'm just going to play a really short amount. I'm not going to play the whole song. I'm just yeah. going to show you why I like it. It's like, is there anybody going to listen to my story all about the girl who came to stay? She's the kind of girl you want so much it makes you sorry. Still you don't regret a single day. Okay, so I mean, come on. He, when he wrote it, he was trying to sound gr like a Greek song. He was telling his producer, George Martin, I want to write a song like Greek style, but to me, it's Russian. Yeah, good, very good. I have a question, first of all, about shooting like a filmmaker to filmmaker. Right. I'd like to understand how right. the whole footage was during these years. Well, it, yeah, in my movie, it's really quite something. I wish uh, Anatoly Goronesko uh, will join us later, I hope. He was the chief cinematographer and he and I are a team. We work together in this symbiotic way that's so excellent for uh, getting results. Um, and it, let me try to explain it this way. We, we, the whole movie was uh, conceived as, as he put it. He says, Alex, wherever you go, when you walk down the street, wherever you go, the party is there. It somehow like comes around you. So I know that as a cinematographer and I'm just gonna get a crew. He hired, he would have two people with him and it was total of three, it depends on you know who was available. But you know, so, so we had, um, you know, Marta was there and we had Fyodor was there and Max. So two of those three would always be with us. And, uh, and so you had um, Anatoly, the chief, sometimes just kind of directing them and sometimes shooting. And mm -hmm. he, um, so first of all, he just knew quite well how to get those guys in situations to catch the magic, to catch the lightning when it happened, you know? Because mm -hmm. things, f crazy, funny stuff does happen. And their job is to be kind of invisible and, and there's a bunch of examples I can tell you in the movie where that happened. You know, they just were alert and they just didn't shake and, you know, they didn't forget to press record, you know. And so everything, it's just you have to be on your toes. It's that kind of thing. And and the other thing, it was, um, it was uh, complimented by people like me, you know, with my iPhone, just kind of like, you know, I did a number, a number of shots is, is my iPhone or Anatoly's iPhone for that matter. We, it's, it's, you're trying to catch it or in fact, 
the wonderful GoPro. The, it's so small, nobody can see it, right? You don't want to make, some people get self-conscious, right? And the GoPro, by the way, is incredible sound. It, is, it's, it came in handy a lot for sound. But the GoPro is an interesting uh, uh, tool because it's so small and it has a nice image. So, I mean, did I could go you, on and on. Did you ever ask permission to shoot? In different we things? never ask permission. You know, although sometimes um, it's good to do, it breaks the ice. I ask permission to shoot when I think somebody's a little nervous and I want to just sort of like chat them up and, mm -hmm. and uh, seduce them, if you will. You know, it's like, let's, hey, do you want to be in a movie? You know, if, if you get a feeling that that'll break the ice and get them like actually interested, you know. But usually, no, we, you know, we don't ask because they might, they'll probably say no, or they might, so. So you know, how about you were cutting this film? About the, about the editing? Yeah, what, what is, how long you do it? Well, you know, I want to tell you because I kind of have a, you know, it, it was it was it was something like a uh, extreme sport for me. What happened was um, when we got done with the three or four weeks of shooting, essentially, I was on my travels, right? And I had a hotel room, and I remember starting this process. But my process was this: I we had you, as I said, let's say four camera people, right? Let's say two or three of them active at all times. And I had, I was in possession of all the hard drives or copies of the hard drives mm -hmm. with um, my laptop, my handy little MacBook, right? And what I did was I uh, wrote a note uh, for every shot, right? And I said, which hard drive it's from and what's the time code of something that's kind of interesting. And then I wrote a note of what happened, you know, what, what the, the content was. And that took about a million years. You know, that took more than a lifetime to actually do that. The amount of hours I did doing that, I would, it, it is ridiculous, right? But I did that because I just had a commitment to know, I wanted to know every shot, right? And then once I had that, I could, I had a concept already of how I wanted to put them together like a jigsaw puzzle or like, you know, how that would fit together. And that was supposed, that generated the plot and I could see where the plot line was going. And then I divided it into 15 emails because each email had, you know, it said this hard drive, this second, you know, this time code, it goes to the next one. So I had already edited it. The editing was done in my mind and on paper and on email. And then when we finally started this so-called editing process, I had already done it, right? So I was there with my, with Max, started it, Max, like, Anatoly said, Max, you're going to have to do this, you know, listen to what Alex says and read his emails and just put that on the screen, you know, uh, as a first draft, of course, right? It's just a first draft. And so that created the first draft. And mm -hmm. then essentially it was Anatoly and I going through it going, and he was great at calling me out for Alex, you don't want that. You know, it's like, we were like, you know, we worked together on that. We sort of Lennon McCartney and we make sure they don't go the wrong way, you know? So, mm -hmm. but us together is a great team for creating something. And the, and, and the goal, and I think we succeeded pretty much is we don't want it to be boring, you know? We want everything to push to the next thing. So you're never bored, you never want to turn it off or you can't turn it off because you want to see what happens next, you know? But it's all, big, but without any script originally, it's all done from montage. And honestly, I put, um, I honestly, I went a year to film school, you know? And even before that, I was at NYU studying under Haig Manoogian who was, you know, um, mentor for um, all the great filmmakers, you know, and and the um, I, he he taught me a little bit, but it was before that actually, in high school, I had this brilliant film teacher called Barbara Scales, who um, in high school she all she did was show us like movies by Ziga Vertov and Eisenstein and explain what that was all about and what montage was all about, and I learned that when I was fifteen. You know, and I never forgot that. And we started making movies back then. We made all these kind of heinous uh, slasher movies that were before slasher movies. And we created the genre. Yeah. So, but anyway, so so yeah. I learned about, I never forgot that. And when the, and, and I was really, and editing has always been a passion for me, you know, and that whole concept of montage. And the idea like Ziga Vertov was just taking the vibrancy and the vitality of Russia during the revolution or that, though, period and he just picked up and showed like workers you know having fun doing their work or something but he the way he uh assembled it 
you didn't need a script you know he that was the that was the the excitement of it and so i was always i always wanted to do that and the other one i have to say one last one i'm sorry see i talk too much last one is is if um is is um you know the guy who did like titty cut follies you know wiseman right mm -hmm. are you familiar with that filmmaker mm -hmm. he, he um so why am i blanking on his first name it's jo not joseph wiseman that's the actor right frederick wiseman frederick wiseman brilliant <laughs> filmmaker he just sets his camera up right and he does it with 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 editing and that also and he's a first close personal friend of my mom you know we had uh, dinner together in Paris uh, during the Paris climate conference thing is going to, so I got to meet him finally, but, uh, that it's that idea of why would you want to, you know, write something that's so funny, you know, why not just take real life and use that, you know, cause, um, that's sort of rhetorical, but you know what I mean? That's, that was the concept. Alex, when I was watching this movie, I was imagining the storytelling, the script behind it. And uh, I found out just abruptly that before you did this film, you had the idea of the story, what you are trying to explain to show your well, culture, this country, people you, you saw there, your interactions with different people. And I feel your documentary like a fiction film because it's really storytelling is great i like yeah, well, it very much i mean you can't imagine how good it feels to hear you say that but i can only tell you it was more of a thematic thing there was no question that uh i fell in love with russia and the soviet union you know and it's like it's a love story about russia really and it's yes, that exactly. and what it is is um uh, you know i knew that uh i wanted to show uh Actually, you know what it is? It's partly this. It's originally this, this was planned as a demo for a reality TV show, a serial, a weekly show of what Alex does in Russia every week, right? And I knew that it was going to be the first time that Americans were ever going to see anything not only real about Russia, but really positive and like, whoa, you know, it's this whole like incredible, uh, you know, uh, situation where Americans and Russians work, are really incredible when they do things together you know it's this positive uh alchemy that happens you know and it's so so the thing is i knew that was going to be a theme so i was always pointing the cameras at that you know that was obvious we didn't even have to say it really because that's just the way i live anyway you know but it's like but that was it so it was like following themes definitely you know it was and then we were of course afraid to like i the reason why i'm so happy that you said that is that all the sort of uh you know, traditional uh, advice givers were saying, well, you know, Alex, you gotta like have lots of scenes where there's conflict, like, well, you know, or your bass player starts having sex with your girlfriend or something. You have to have that kind of stuff or no, or it's, you know, you have to have like this negativity and this kind of, you know, fights and all this stuff. And I was just, I was re rebelling against that in a sense. I was saying, well, maybe, maybe there's more energy in the surprisingness of the friendship and, and the, uh, you know, the work together thing um, and the Russian uh, uh, brotherhood thing, you know, it's like, why, maybe that has more energy than a, than a silly fight scene, you know, or a car crash or something, you know. Can you tell me the story of your love to Russia, when it started, how did Well, it yeah, I mean, there's no doubt about, I mean, as kids, we were always like, oh, Russia was the cool, mysterious, evil empire thing with the beautiful women and the, uh, and the, the Dostoevsky kind of crazy stuff. And so we, it was always just sort of a, a flavorful thing, even, you know, way back when. But then I happened to be in Berlin, right? Uh, kind of when the well, wall was you know, about to come down, but it hadn't come down yet. And I was with a band, we had gigs, you know? And the thing was that, um, but the thing is I had studied Russian in school just because uh, I, I, I went to university uh, finally, to not to get a job, but to, uh, I, I looked at it as a, like a, like a karate belt for your mind, like a, like a physical work, a mental workout. You know, that was the whole point of it. So I listened, I took my advice from Nietzsche, who I had happened to have read, who said, you know, if you really want to work your mind out or want to get something out of like academics or something like that, 
don't forget social studies, even though science is fascinating, you can be fascinated, but if you really want to get something out of, out of intellectual pursuit, you got to study literature. That's where it all is. It's all in the literature. And that's where, <laughs> that's what you really get. You're, you're, you become a better person and you benefit way more. So I took him literally and I checked it out and I started to agree with him. I said, yeah, you know, we're sitting here talking about Gogol and, uh, you know, and, the, and Professor Mirsky. And I'm like, wow, this is really Prince Mirsky, that is. And so we had, you know, a great time, you know, and that, so I learned Russian. And then that was like 80 in the 80s. And then 1989 came around and I was in Berlin with a band and my producer, my music producer was a, a dealer in high-end microphones, like the best microphones in the world, which are made in Germany and places like that. But the biggest buyer of these vintage, incredibly valuable, wonderful um, recording devices. Grundig. And he bought and sold them and he was scavenging for them all over the world because they, that's it, that was what he wanted to do. And, but the biggest buyer of those originally was, was Melodia Records in Moscow. They had more than anybody. So he sent me on a mission. I took a, he, you know, I took a plane from Berlin to Moscow for a week. I had a seven day round trip to rejoin my band in Berlin. But my job was to get those microphones, right? And I could tell you the story about that. Although the really short story of that is they, I went to Melody Records and says, oh yeah, we had them, but you know, we're the Soviet Union. So when we realized that we had to maintain them, we, we thought it was like, it made more sense to just grind them up with a grinder and just get rid of them, you know? So, so they, but we, it, it was a lie, you know, of course they sold them on the black market or something, but there was, there were no more microphones. But every day I was in, uh, I asked the cab driver, I had my guitar, I always had my guitar, right? And I, so I asked the cab driver, I gave him Marlboro cigarettes and which is what they told me to do. Cause the Russian Marlboros were stale because they were in the, too long in the warehouse. I had fresh Marlboros and I said, take me to where I should play my guitar. So they said, okay, I'm taking you to the Arbot. <laughs> so I went to the Arbot and I, every day for seven days, I played on the Arbot, which was, that was when I fell in love with Russia, really. It was just wonderful. People coming, you know, just every day, people coming down and talking, playing music. And then at that time, there was really very little in the stores, you know, and you, you could go to a store and there'd be like one. What year it was? 89 in the summer, summer of 89. 89. I was in and, Moscow and I lived, on, I lived on old Arbat. So we so were- You probably saw me, I was in front of Vakhtanga every day for seven days, I'm sure you saw yes. me. Next no building for the Vakhtanga Theater. Yeah, did you see- Right in front of Vakhtanga every day, every day. And, and it was really something because, uh, you know, we would play and we would collect huge bags of rubles because you couldn't, people would lose the rubles because you go to the store and you couldn't buy anything anyway. But we had these big sacks, huge sacks of rubles. And we, at, when it was dark, there was nothing, right? Unless you were rich and knew where the oligarchs were, you, you couldn't, the only place that was, you could go at night were the tourist hotels who wouldn't let my Russian friends in, said no Russians, you know? So I didn't want to do that. So at the end of every time we were playing on the street, when it got dark, we would take this huge bag of rubles to the Hotel Belgrad, you know where that is. And we gave it to the lay gir to the girl, you know? who was working there and she would disappear and come back with everything for a quartiernik, for a party in somebody's flat. So every night we party till dawn in these places that, so how could I not fall in love with Russia after playing music all night, partying on all day, partying all night? How, you know, where else could I do that in that, you know, with that kind of, you know, situation. And so, so then I went back to the West, but the thing was this, they were, there were photographs of me playing there and cut, to, if you remember the Arlequin Theater, which the leader was this uh, wonderful um, uh, Armenian director, Sergei Melkonyan. And he ran this theater and he was trying to bring this troupe to San Francisco. And he had with him his sidekick, Oleg Bernov. And so they showed up at ACT where my mom happened to be artistic director. And they were trying to get there, talk to my mom about advice on how to bring their theater to America. And she put the, the, the biggest newspaper in San Francisco is the Chronicle, right? The pink section. There was a huge photo of me on the Arbot. And so she shows that photo to these guys and young Oleg, the rock and roll Oleg, the rock and roll actor, he says, I know that guy. We partied together, right? So he, and so that led to Sergei, we met and he invited my band, not for seven days, but for six months, it turned out with work visas, everything legit 
we, we, we came in 1990 in April and stayed until October, the day of Einheit in Germany, where we arrived in Berlin without knowing it. But there is, it was six months. That, and so then I deeply fell in love with Russia and I could, I'm already talking too much, but that's where I could explain the details of how you fall in love with the country. You know, that's how you do it. I mean, they had our video in Dvajdi Dva, Komarachiski Canal, remember that? Mm -hmm. Our video with all the talk, you know, so we were recognized on, this, on the Metro because we had pretty, pretty visible guy. My bass player, this long, dark hair, and the drummer was looked like a guy from Motley Crue. Yeah. So yeah, we were quite a phenomenon. Yeah, let me ask you a question. Did you have a chance to meet with any of so-called underground musicians of those times? Like uh, Kokos well, Kinchev, maybe uh, Butusov, Vyacheslav Butusov, Stas Namin? Well, yeah, you mentioned Stas Namin. That's funny, because that's the irony. He was the opposite of underground. He was, Stas Namin was the guy that the underground guys hated for, for because his uncle was on the Politburo. He got all the gigs, right? Mm -hmm. So it was like, they all hated him, jealous, right? But we met Stas. Stas took us into the Zilioni Chatter in Gorky Park, and he took us under his wing a little bit, and we got his singer was like Peter O'Toole, is a super funny guy, and we my, all. My son was editing newspaper for the for Namin, Gorky Park. Really? He was yeah. He was an editor. So we were all in the same options, but I mean seriously, yes, there's no doubt. And we were walking and, somewhere close to each other those times. Yeah, I'm sure I, we met. There's no question. We must have met. And, and, and we took this one classic train ride to, Saint, to uh, Leningrad with a Stas Naman band. Um, and I met Natalia Lapin. I met all incredible adventures. Um, we played in the uh, October Skizal in, in Leningrad. Whoa. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was huge, right? We played two different nights and it was really uh, with Stas Naman. It was, I could tell you lots of stories, you know? Um, but that, again, but that, but we went all the way to Baikal, you know, so it was like, it wasn't just, we were in the Ukrainsky SSR, we played in Odessa, as I said, you know, just the romanticness of Odessa in the summertime when you walk down the board, you know, and people are playing guitars every 10 meters, you know, there's like a group of people singing songs, that really made an impression, and, and those, and you know, in America, we all know Beatles songs or something, they all knew their songs, you know, and it was like, I started recognizing them. That's when I learned like Perucha Galitsin and Gobstop and, you know, Pastoy Paravas, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm learning all those songs. I mean, it's like something about the Russian uh, way of, of doing things. Yeah, Alex, do you or did you keep records of uh, every place where you went, where you performed? Well, of we have some unbelievable photographs, and especially from uh, Novosibirsk. I have these just incredible eight by tens these guys were taking up when we were playing. It's, it's, that's the first photo you see in my movie It's from that. But it's like this guy shows up the next day with all these prints, you know, before it was digital, right? So we were sitting there um, in a huge, in the center of Novosibirsk is a gigantic uh, plaza with huge uh, proletarian uh, statues and there's Lenin and, you know, but they were out doing a vigil in the summertime for their, uh, they were protesting with a 24 hour vigil because their friends were in prison across the street. And I would join them every night when these candlelight vigils singing with my acoustic guitar. And finally they invited my band, which was playing a normal show in a big hockey rink, but we decided to join the protest. And by the way, this protest was Territoria Svobodna Komunisma. You know, they were again, they were not coming. They, they were ready. And they had Russian armbands. We all had Russian armbands, not Soviet. So it was just sort of a, but the police didn't care. They, they were ready to change too. You know, it was, it was time to change, you know, time to go back to Russia. So it was, so nobody was getting, you know, taken away. But, but the crazy thing was they, they gave us, they took the electric power from the Metro and they strung these huge cables. And we had this huge outdoor concert in front of zillions of people. And we have these incredible photos of that because this high end camera guy not only took the photos, but came back the next day after printing huge stacks of beautiful old fashioned black and white, you know, uh, prints, you know, that you don't see these days. Alex, tell me how you met with Anatoly Goronescu. Wow, well, that's really interesting because he's an Easter guy, actually, he's in Easter. Um, and, and we were playing gigs in Easter at this place called Bielilis, the, the White Fox. 
and Alman was the boss and Alman used to hire Anatoly to be his sound guy, you know? And so one of our gigs there, um, we met this wild guy. He was, he always is a pretty, uh, you know, appeared to us as this kind of energetic, wide-eyed kind of guy, a real go-getter guy. And he, he kept talking to us about his 360 technology and his, you know, ver you know he's, he's on the cutting edge. He really is. And finally he started for years, he was, he'd come to my gigs and take, you know, some things. And we, and we were a little bit skeptical of, you know, we thought it was gimmick a little bit, but it turns out we use some of this 360 stuff. 360 cameras are incredible. You, in the editing process, if you wanna see what's in the corner of the room and what's, whose face is on a matchbook, you can do that, you know, that you can't do with other cameras. So he's, he's, uh, he's a phenomenon. And like I say, we work together mentally, like he's, we're on the same page, you know? You know if I were you, yeah. I will continue doing some uh, really fich fiction movie about your career, about your love stories, about yeah. musician uh, like uh, personality. It's a great. Yeah, I'm ready. You I can be the so right. I see so many, so much rich material right. in your hands. You should do it. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, we're de <laughs> believe me, it's like, uh, I grew up with, you know, loving movies and I always want to be involved in movies. And, and, and the thing is, I looked at movies, movies are a wonderful collaborative uh, enterprise. Like, you know, I would say, hey, why don't you uh, write us, write a treat, treatment or something to get me going or something. You know, it's, it's great to work with other people and it's, it's um, and bounce ideas off of them. So what you just said will probably spark an idea in me and, you know, and I bounce it off you and, I understand that you're, you know, you're tied in with, uh, into the film world for many years, and you know, and um, well, you know how those French New Wave guys all started out as uh, as film critics and you know writing about films and Godard and all those guys, right? So I, I got the impression that you're kind of like that, that you're kind of like the Russian Godard or Truffaut. Correct me if I'm wrong. You know? Yeah, uh, I guess Igor meant um, a film with you as a main character, a fiction. And yeah. you, you are the main character. Yeah, if he's gonna write it, if he's gonna write the script, that's great, yeah. Igor, how about the script? Yeah. I have to investigate your life from the very beginning. Yeah. Lainey, uh, uh, Lainey, the uh, friend of your family, the actress, I talked to her about your family and she explained me Wait, 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 who did you talk to? Wait, before you said, who are we talking about? Which actress? Uh, Lainey. Oh, Leanne. 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 Okay, Leanne. She, she told me that your parents are very connected with art and you, they have been in China a lot of times and she, she was a manager of the theater over there. So well, yeah. it's a great story about your childhood about your parents well, ironically enough i was not on that trip to shanghai yeah it's strange not but i was my uncle her, my mom's brother is an incredible uh businessman uh, just a phenomenal maverick he was and he was on nixon's enemies list by the way mm -hmm. and a super positive uh successful businessman you know big money pay, but would pay his workers way more than anybody else and he he sent me to China in 1984 on a mission to do, uh, it's too long to talk about now, a little off topic, but that's when I was in China, it was 1984, like when Deng Xiaoping, 1985, when Deng Xiaoping was doing the first opening up of China. And mm -hmm. I had this incredible experience in Hainan, the Southern Island near Vietnam, as big as Taiwan. And I, we toured around the island, I could write about that. You know, that was unbelievable. But I was not with my mom in Shanghai, never been to Shanghai. But my Chinese experience, actually, most recently, is Blagoveshansk in Russia, which is on the river, and you can see China. And the Chinese department stores have big signs in Russian, come over and buy our stuff, you know? So that's my, the, I, I was that close to China in Blagoveshansk, my favorite Russian city, by the way. When people ask me, what's your favorite Russian city, Alex? Blagoveshansk. And people are shocked, but it's like because they have so know, much yeah. energy. There's Why? so much yeah. rockers. Why? Please. They're rock. They have rock energy. They love Motorhead and like, you know, they love uh, they love the Ramones and they love, you know, this kind of like high energy rock and 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 they and they're really incredible people. 
um, that treated me incredibly well. And they always organized amazing things. And it's, it's got this visual thing of the Amur River with China on the other side. And it has, oh, I was, yeah. That's my feeling. The yeah. far from Moscow are you, yeah. the poorest life is, is there. Right. Very poor, but the people are better. Yeah, that's true. It's, it's an it's a inverse ratio. I guess you could say that, yeah. I mean, I definitely spent a lot of time in the far, I mean, to, to educate, for people who don't know, there's Siberia, but that's nothing. Then they get the Dalny Vostok. The far east is just as big as Siberia, but it's further east, you know, and that's where nobody goes. And But uh, I go there, you know, and in fact, on uh, this, my movie, during the pandemic, it's, a, it's harder to do my normal traveling around, but I'm basing it on, um, I met this wonderful guy um, called um, Vitaly Karyakin, and he got my film in seven film festivals, one, and that's how I'm, going to travel around Russia in the next few months, you know, St. Petersburg's next, and then like Izhesk, and then believe it or not, Nadim. Now, most of my Russian friends never heard of Nadim, you know. Nadim is if you go to the middle of Siberia where it's 40 below and you freeze your eyeballs off, that's not even halfway to Nadim. Nadim is all the way further north, almost to like where Santa Claus lives, right? Almost. So it's like, there's a film festival there, and I'm going to and I met a guy there who plays a real Indian sitar. We're going to do gigs up there around this film festival. So I'm going to have a huge adventure. That's how I'm basing my traveling now. Alex, is there a place on earth where you are not willing to go? Well, no, not, I'm not, there's no place I'm not willing to go, but the, 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 the embarrassment and the shame is that I've never been to the best parts of America, although not my best, but I've never been to most of America. And it's like, I really want to. Like my favorite music, like, you know, Little Richard and, and uh, the best jazz and blues and rock all come from New Orleans, right? That's where it comes, that's the basic origin of all that. My, my favorite stuff. I've never been there, you know? I've never been to Texas where all these great guitar players and all this, never been to Florida, never been to Seattle. Where My favorite musicians are like Kurt Cobain and Jimi Hendrix and the Sonics, right? Sonic's mm -hmm. best band of all time. Never been to Seattle. I've never been to Memphis. I've never been to Nashville. I mean, I'm um, about to kill myself. I'm about to hang myself now with shame or Hari Kari from, you know, um, I should not be able so to live. I should not be able to live. You, you we never might say that you know Russia better than, than the state. Way better, not even close, not even close. Wow. Not even close. And it's like ridiculous. And in fact, wait a minute. I took the test to, I'm getting my Russian like, you know, green card essentially. And to get that, they, they test you on not only language, but do you know which general never lost a battle? Do you know all this stuff about Russian culture and history? I knew all that stuff. My gosh. Do you yeah. know the name of John Reed and his book, 10 Days They Shook the World? Well, this yeah, I read it. I love that book. I love that book. Seriously, I love this that book. Is part of the test. Did you know this? I love that book. I love that book. One read, yeah. Uh, I yeah, I read it a million years ago. I've got it in my in Poland somewhere in my in my. I am asking uh, because my feeling is that you are John Reed of our times. The can be, you know, but I'm so underground though. So I'm totally underground. Music, what he yeah. was trying to express in books. But he's the he's the guy that they based the movie Reds on, right? Warren Ron Beatty. Yeah, I saw. I didn't actually see that. People warned me it's boring, but I should see it. It's but, very, um, sad, very, I, very sad movie. Yeah, I love Warren Beatty, but um, but it's like, I don't know, I love his sister too, Shirley MacLaine. Ooh. Yeah, great family. But he was, they loved, uh, I mean, John, I remember there was some incredible parts of that book, you know, but you know, you know, basically, um, I was telling my friend, I was um, speaking of Russian history and I was just today talking about it, how I, we filmed a, a video on Kronstadt, you know, and that whole history of what happened in Kronstadt. But it goes on and on. Like, like I say, are we getting any questions from the, uh, the people out in, in TV land? Are we getting uh, written questions or anything like that? Is this Q&A open to people? Or is there some kind of a feed going on here? Yeah, it is open so far. No questions from them. I have a question. I was pretty okay. impressed by your 32 hour marathon. Oh, yeah. I'll Fair never forget that, by the way. Yeah. So, how, uh, what did it feel like? And what, Unbelievable. 
what was the first thing you did after you stopped? Oh, that's such a good question. I went to a carnival for six hours because I was Alex. so hyped up. I was so hyped up, but actually, well, right after I did interviews and that's on, I can send you the interviews because we did a compilation of the TV uh, reportage that happened after that. But then my friend said, hey, there's a, it was 6 p.m. Said, well, there's a carnival with some bands playing, let's go. You know, you so are impossible. Uh, did you did you have those little technical breaks in between, like a glass? Well, yeah. I mean, I'll tell you what it was. You know, it was really like this. Okay, you have to first of all, you have to understand. You know, in basketball, there's a clock that has the total time of the game, and then it has the twenty. It has the thirty second shot clock. You have to get a shot off. You have to shoot the ball within thirty seconds. Exactly the same for me. There's the big clock and I'm trying to break the record at 27 and go to 32 hours. And then there's the 30 second clock. And when I stop a song, I have 30 seconds to eat a French fry. And my mom gave me these like, you know, vitamin C uh, drinks, you know, and take a sip of something and then launch the next song, 30 seconds. If I miss that, it's all over. And all the work you did is for not, right? And I can tell you an example of that. But basically that's the short story. So. But you have five minutes every hour that you can bank. So at, at 55 minutes after the hour, right? You can stop, go to the bathroom and come back five minutes. Or you can do the smart thing, which is what I did. You play three hours with not any breaks like that. Yeah, and you and have 15 you minutes. Yeah, you have 15 minutes, right. So that's what I would generally do. And there's a lot more to it than that, but that's the short story. And believe me, that's the... Uh, you know, I'm motivated by the fear of failure, right? Because if I fail, it's all over, right? So I could never fail that at that point. I, it, there would be no way, you know? But I have to say that the thing is, it, what it does to your mind, it's sort of a, you reach a higher spiritual plane when you do something like that. It's like, you know, it, the whole room starts uh, changing in a way. It's like, you, you get this, you start to see what fakirs of India see when they stay up for 22 days, you know? You start to see that, you know? Just a little glimpse of that. Mm -hmm. Because you're singing, part of it is because you're singing and playing. You're not just yeah. sitting there. You're singing and playing all the time. And here's another thing. The first 12 hours were all the Beatles songs that ever came to America in their career, right? In the, before they broke up. I, I made that as a list. And I, I know all of them because since I was six, I've been memorizing them, right? So I knew them all from memories. I played every Beatles song. And you have to understand that that's such high quality. It's like playing Mozart, or, you know, level music, right? So it's like, oh, you just played 12 hours of the best music that's ever been written. You're going to feel actually kind of good, right? It does something to your soul, you know, when you play that kind of a, a, a repertoire, you know, you're, it, it's not like you're just, you know, doing nothing you're actually playing really good music for 12 hours and i'm i appreciate that you know so i, I was in a great mood and then it was like oh now it's easy because singing paul mccartney uh is is difficult right it's high notes you know but then i could when the beatles section was over i could just play some hendrix songs or my songs or you know and it was way easier so it was downhill only 20 more hours after that just 20 hours to go <laughs> Right. So I understood Easy. that your, your, your mom was there with you. Did no, she... no, no, no. You know, who was there? There was a few people. You had to have a quorum. You had to have a minion. You had to have 10 people. If you didn't have 10 people there, you also lose. There's all these rules. There's a book of rules that we all worked out. Um, with Zygmunt, the guy who owned the bar, helped a lot. And, you know, um, we had Kuba Polich helping a lot. We had a lot of my, you know, Polish. I lived in Poland. I was based in Poland for a long time, like 10 years. Okay, okay. And my team, my, my buddies, my, my posse, you know, my, we roll with the community, right? They were all there. And it was like, they were helping a lot. Because you had, if you didn't have those 10 people, there was like this one, I remember this one cute girl from Warsaw, she somehow stayed the whole time. You know, I just remember, I remember certain people were just there, you know? And, and if, if it got to close to being less than 10, someone would have to go out in the street and grab some bum uh -huh. sleeping on the, on the, and get him. And, you know. and were they listeners? Were they assistants, helpers, uh, participants? No, started, oh, no, wait a minute. No, you see, I didn't get, you have to understand that there are, the rules are number one observer who's taking notes and writing everything down. Number two observer doing the same thing. And then the Uber observer who's watching them three people and then the fourth person on crew was a nurse standing right in front of the stage in case you fall over right there's a nurse so 
professional it has to be so that was a rule and so but though that team had to run in shifts you they couldn't work more than four hours and we knew we had 32 we had to have eight shifts and you know to put that, that kind of thing together what kind of work that is right forget playing 32 hours that was easy it was getting ready for it was difficult i would never want to do that again but we had helped the president they say the mayor of the town this wonderful woman knew that it would be the number one story in poland which it was and all the networks so she knew it would promote her agenda there was like a i was smart enough to do it in a middle-sized city that needed promotion right they had a new university and a new program they wanted the tv cameras there right so they made sure they she ordered the entire workforce of the civic uh, municipal you know government they had to work for me they couldn't say no they had to be on that crew so they were all there um it was hilarious right and they like they, they enjoyed it i mean i was playing good music right i was entertaining them you know i was putting on a show yeah. So they were bored, Actually, right? Igor and I planned this uh, Q and A to to be thirty three hours hour long. Yeah, uh, no problem. You know, but it's like that's like uh, I don't as long as I'm, but I'm not you know playing songs. So it's real. I did. You got me to play one. Yeah. Do we have any questions? One question. Yeah, have a look. Meanwhile, while Igor is looking for it, yes. Are you ready? What made you come back to Russia? Ask James McKee. Come but back. At what point? What point in time are we talking about now? What made you come back to what, Russia? What point in time are we yeah. talking about? Yeah. I've got. I've, I've crossed the border a million times. So what do you mean? I'm not sure what you're saying. When? Which one? <laughs> this equation. Maybe the. Oh no! Wait a minute. Now I think I get it. After the Soviet Union, there was a huge break. I was lazy. I didn't want to get a visa, and I regret it. Because the stories of the wild, wild Russian East, you know, are legendary. You know, I, I missed all of that Al Capone stuff, right? But, but I was very nearby. I was, I was existing in all the Eastern European countries, having an incredible time in places like Kosovo and Macedonia and Bulgaria and Romania and mostly Poland, but Czech Republic a lot. You know, Slovakia, Slovenia. I love these places, right? They're just incredible. And but I was. You don't, you don't need a visa, right? So I was just doing my EU thing or whatever. But the thing was, I had a, a German friend that was hanging out with me in Poland who was working in Moscow for an ad agency in Moscow. And he just said, Alex, I just booked a gig for you in Kitai Gorod, you know, at the uh, place, the same, the bar, the same name as when I did my Guinness record. It was the um, Bourbon Street Bar, you know? in Kitai Gord. And he said, I booked a gig for you at Bourbon Street, you know. Um, you know, that's where at, at three in the morning, all the strippers are like dancing on the bar. You know, it's like, I like you, Alex, you have to go there and play your gig, right? You got to get the visa now. So he kind of Shanghai'd me, right? But, and I re but it was a great uh, push because then I got my visa. Hilarious story about that, by the way, but for another time, I arrived and I, it just dawned on me, what was I not doing here for the last 20 years? You know, this is so much better than anything. Like, so that's what got me back into it. That was like 2011 or 12, I can't even remember. Something like 10 years ago, you know, but more like eight or nine, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> I, so think, I think it was 2012, maybe, 11, 12. But the situation with night bars uh, had improved, yeah? Since the first time you well, no, no, What it improved was, um, you know, was was the was the crime, I guess, you know, somehow the crime had gone down by that point. But but the um, I mean, I've never felt safer. I mean, American City, you know, as you know, I was like, you better know where you are. You're you just might get ripped up, beaten. And, and the end of the fight is somebody's dead. Right. Because everybody's got a gun. But, you know, in, in Europe, it's there's no there's no part of Europe or Russia anywhere near as dangerous as, you know, the bad parts of the dangerous parts of American cities. I mean, that's what make, gives American cities maybe their gravitas and why the music has been so great in America is it's such a dangerous place or something. But, you know, the fact is that a fight in Eastern Europe or Russia ends with uh, somebody hitting somebody and they might get knocked out. But in America, you're dead, right? They kill you with a gun, right? So that doesn't exist. But, so, but, but still, you hear stories of people getting killed in, you know, in, the, in the early years of Russia. Alex. I know your devotion to the climate change fight. Yes. I am with you, I am with you completely. Yeah. And I am worried about our future. First Don't worry all, anymore. I've got I've got good news. Yeah, because people are so neglect all these uh, garbage they leave after them, 
all right. this uh, pollution. I agree with you and I'm on your side. And I know that you wrote a, a song about that. Can, I wrote you a song perform, about can you perform this song about climate yeah, change? I just, yeah, I do. I just want to say a couple of words to make it understandable because um, what happened was the 10 years of reporting as a journalist on all of the uh, climate change conferences, it was based on trying to find the smartest, uh, most informative and practical minded people that I could to educate myself and then my readers. And one thing led to another. And I finally, to make a long story short, it turns out, as you know, as from your background of your uh, screensaver or whatever thing, we are the blue planet, you know? We're not the land planet, we're the blue planet. So that's number one. Oh, what does that mean? Well, turns out that the oceans are not just empty blue things, right? They're full of life and they're full of uh, um, photosynthesis. And photosynthesis is the most important factor in bringing our climate back to a, a, a manageable balance. Because what photosynthesis does is it takes greenhouse effect gases like mm -hmm. CO2, it repurposes them into life, into plankton, into things and into things that flow to the, that sink to the bottom of the sea. So there's nothing, uh, you know, emit, but when you read articles or you talk to all the stars of the green movement, you own 99% of the time, and I would imagine 99% of the people who casually check out what's the, they equate, they equate the climate problem with, oh, we need clean cars, clean factories, reduce emissions. That's all you pretty much hear about. And everything else is, is on the margins. Well, it turns out that that would be true uh, you know, 40 years ago when, when the parts per million of greenhouse you know, uh, uh, gases rose above a certain point. You know, when it was still pretty low, yeah, the best thing to do would be to have clean cars. But we've gone way past that. Now we're getting cooked and you know, we are being destroyed uh, in terms of uh, you know, the uh, climate by what's already there. And it doesn't go away by itself, right? It doesn't go away by itself. So, and you, and so, and that, that's one point, but then if the media gets that, then they, t they, they still don't get it because everything you'll read at that point will be some ridiculous contraptions of how they're gonna pull, you know, build these machines that will take care of that problem. You know, it will take CO2 and turn it, and that's trillions of dollars and crazy blah, blah, blah. So, so people then become rationally more depressed or you know, they think, well, forget it, right? Give up, you know, they, they, so, so that creates more depression. So it turns out there's good news though. All of that, you can just put aside. You can just put that aside because it turns out that the planet you know, is not ready. It's not time to surrender yet. It's not time to throw in the towel. You know, it's not time to give up because the planet still has the wherewithal. And what it is, is we are mostly ocean. And most of the breaths you take come from oxygen that comes from you know, plankton and things like that, taking CO2 and giving you oxygen. That's, but that's way down for reasons that are too long to explain right now. That's way down, but it's really easy to bring that back up and have the power of the oceans bring the greenhouse gas thing back into balance, you know, and it's way more complex, you know, it's not that simple, but that's the essence of it. There are natural groovy green, nice things you can do to make the ocean healthy. And it's not about plastics and pollution and overfishing. Those are things that exist that are problems, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about something else where the plankton and the, the fish that come out to like to the ocean and to eat food, they're not getting food. The plankton are not getting fed, and it's really easy to bring that uh, that back to the oceans. It's very low money. It's very, it, and I'm involved with people. You know, it's cheap, fast, and easy, and good, and wonderful for everybody. And believe it or not, it's happening. And it, you, you don't have to wait for oligarchs. You don't have to wait for governments. You don't have to wait for anybody because it's already happening. Because it's like easy and fast and cheap, and people are. And 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 I wrote one article called "A Hundred Villages," and that would give you the over like a hundred villages just do it for themselves. Fishing villages that have been decimated because they used to have like lives, you know, where they would go out fish and come back to their families and have a life. Now they can't do that because the fish are gone. So they go out for two weeks and get, you know, die before they come home. You know, so you have this bringing back the villages brings back the climate because that's what brings back the fish. 
and you bring back the fish and that brings back the climate balance. And believe it or not, the numbers add up. You know, it's, if you investigate it, it actually works. So, so therefore it's, it is happening and people can just, you know, yes, you have to, you don't want to overwhelm it with crazy amounts of emissions. You know, emissions will over what, if you just go nuts and just keep pumping more CO2 in the air, okay, you could overwhelm all that, but it's already happening. You know, the oil company's going out of business. It's all that's going out of business. The clean cars are coming in anyway. So you don't have to like lose, you know, you don't have to kill yourself over it or get too depressed. You can just kind of like, uh, just investigate and, and just, you know, Greta Thunberg says, follow the science, right? Well, you got to follow, she's right. And I love her, right? I met her, you know, she's cool, but she doesn't quite know the latest science, you know, and the latest science is that it's not, and, and, and she says actually, yes, there's a machine that takes CO2 out of the atmosphere. We have to do that. It's called a tree. Well, that was, that's her, you know, contribution, but uh, unfortunately we're not the tree planet. We're the ocean planet and trees take, 20 years to grow and they burn down and the global warming conditions. And, you know, you have to push people off their land. It's, it's much better to let the plankton do it, you know, way better. Okay. So that's the context. And I wrote the song in, a, in a, uh, from the point of view of 2050, where we're looking back in 2020 and I'll just play a little bit of it. Like, it's like, Oh yeah. Everything's all right now. We don't got to sing blue no more. Hey, now, come on. Listen up now, listen up. All right. It was a runaway train headed for a crash. Out of control, gonna totally smash. All our hope was gone, or so it seemed. Because our cities were all going underwater. Seemed like no way to save it for your son or your daughter. It even just about almost fooled me. It was climate ruined. Yeah, what were we doing? Hey, Igor, what were we doing? We were messing everything up for everyone. But you know what it's now? Now it's climate restoration. Yeah, we did the calculations. That's right, we checked it out. And now we're pulling out the CO2 by the gigaton. All right, we're doing all right now. Woo! Oh, yeah. Oh, man. Come on now. Oh yeah, well, come on. The powers that be were getting us in a panic. You might even say they were acting satanic, but what kind of fools we mortals be, you know? But we took control of the situation and instituted climate restoration. And everybody finally agreed to let it be. Yeah, we let it be, climate restoration. Hey, it's time for celebration now, woo. Because we did what Russ George said and restored the oceans to the max. Yeah. Hey, Russ. Now it's climate restoration. Hey. We even shrunk the population just to make sure, you know. And now everything's cool, baby. I got a little chant. Now everybody chant. Everybody chant. It's like I did this in Poland at a, at a climate march. I made it up on the spot in front of all these people at this uh, demonstration. And, you know, I think it was in uh, Katowice. Yeah. Coal, gas, and oil, we left it in the soil. Coal, gas, and oil, we left it in the soil. Coal, gas, come on everybody, come on. We left it in the soil. Woo! Coal, gas, and oil, we left it in the soil, baby. Wow. Who said climate restoration is for the future generation. Climate restoration, we got clean energy innovation. Climate restoration, we even stopped the Arctic ice from elimination. It's pretty important, you know, you, you can't let the Arctic ice melt in big trouble. Climate restoration, we gave our kids a healthy nation. There was climate ruin, yeah, but we saw that storm brewing back in the 2020s, you know. But I think you thought it was all over, didn't you? I bet you thought it was all over. But we didn't, we didn't let it happen. Actually, we got on the right road, yeah. We got on the right road. We got on the right road, not a moment too soon. There it is.
Alex. It's powerful. Yeah, it's impressive. Powerful. It's a good finish of our conversation. Yeah, Alex. yeah. You are, you are a fantastic person. I want to keep with, be in touch with you out of the borders of this conversation. Yeah, I'm ready. You know, send me, you know, send me your ideas. It's but it's great, great, you know. Actually, my friend Atma Noor, the drummer, is working on a uh, drum part for this song right now. And um, I want to say hi, actually, to Dennis Matuizo, my Russian drummer here in my band, Alex Carlin Band. And I want to say hi to Andre um, Samoylov, the bass player. Um, and so uh, next time we'll um, get those guys on the, on the show. Um, but who else? Um, Leanne, where's Leanne who? Anyway, I thought Leanne was gonna, um, she, it's all because of her, by the way. All this is because of Leanne. I wanna say big thank you to Leanne. And of yeah. course, Kathleen and, and George. Um, but what can I say? Um, too many people to thank right now. Um, I, th I think, okay, so what's, uh, what's next? Um, I mean, Igor, we're gonna make a movie. Is that what we're doing next? I look forward to doing it. Okay, we'll, we'll continue. So when we go offline, uh, we'll like, uh, figure yeah. this out. You know? Yeah. Okay, Thank great. Thank you so much, Alex. And I really hope to see you in Moldova sometime. Maybe Ooh. this September. <laughs> well, yeah, as soon as the borders open up and the, uh, uh, you know, I can, I can uh, come to California. I'm you guys are in Cal You guys are in LA right now? In LA, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, Excellent. we'll discuss it, yeah. All right, I'm, I'd like to come yeah. here at ASAP. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Okay, thank the Asian yeah. World Film Festival. Come on, Asian World Film Festival. I heard good things about it. Um, Alexander Payne, the uh, Academy Award winning uh, director, screenwriter, um, told me that your film festival is really a good one. It's a really good one. So that is coming from a good mm -hmm. authority. Uh, so I'm happy to be part of it. <laughs>